Welcome to Time to Act, Closing the Menstrual Health Gap. My name is Femi O.K. This conversation is for you if you have ever had a period, if you know someone who's had a period, and if you have never had a period. So this conversation is for everybody. It is about, in the next one hour, talking about menstrual health. For anyone who has a menstrual cycle, how do they do so in a dignified and healthy way, wherever they happen to be around the world? We have some expert guests who will be here to have that conversation. You are part of the conversation. So that comment section, that is for you. And I will be posing some facts and questions for you to debate as we have this conversation. Let me introduce you to your panel. Sahil Tesfu is Chief Strategy Officer at Essity. Gary Barker is the president and CEO for Equimundo. Danielle Engel is youth and adolescence lead for UNFPA. And Nadia Okamoto is the co-founder of August. It's good to have everybody with us. Thank you for making an hour of your time. Um, I'm gonna start with Sahil. Sahil, May the 28th is Menstrual Hygiene Day. But you have an issue with the name of the day. And can you explain why? Well, I think uh, thank you, Femi, uh, for uh, for the great introduction here uh, to this Essentials talk. So I have an issue with the day is uh, maybe a bit of an exaggeration, but I would like to invite us to realize uh, on today that it's not just about menstrual hygiene. It's actually about menstrual health uh, and menstrual health encompasses everything from physical health to social uh, and the social well-being, as well as also mental health. So the topic uh, is quite broad. And I just don't want us not to forget that uh, when we talk about it today. Right. So what makes this an essential talk as far as Essity is concerned? Yes. So we're very excited to host uh, today's Essentials talk. Uh, 1.8 billion people menstruate uh, every month uh, across the world. And yet, as we have also seen in the short uh, movie uh, as an introduction here, many millions actually have to do so in a non-dignified and non-healthy uh, way. Uh, and this is uh, what constitutes the global uh, menstrual health gap. And again, it spans across uh, physical well-being, mental well-being, as well as social well-being. At SET, our purpose is to break barriers uh, to well-being. This includes menstrual health. We sell menstrual products, solutions and services across the globe. But we also know that we can't just fix uh, the issue of the menstrual health gap alone because it goes beyond just the products. We have advocated, uh, educated, informed uh, broken taboos and stigmas around the category uh, as we do business. But we know the topic is a lot more complex than that. So we're very happy to have this multi-stakeholder discussion here because we think it needs many to close the menstrual health gap. We're happy to do our part, but we invite also so everyone else to take action. And today is the 10th anniversary of the Menstrual Hygiene Day, the Global Menstrual Hygiene Day. So I think it's a great day now today to discuss this. We should discuss it every day, but it's a perfect day today to do it uh, because, you know, it's been 10 years. So let's take stock uh, of where we are today and what still needs to be done. So we hope we can inspire uh, action. Uh, we can have a fruitful dialogue here, solutions-oriented dialogue. And I thank everyone on behalf of SET for dialing in. I thank the fellow panelists here. And I, of course, also thank you, Femi, for taking us to, through to today's discussion here. So, panel, in the UK, one in 10 people who have a menstrual cycle have been told never to mention it in front of anybody. So I'm going to just put that out there for the comment section for our viewers watching. What should be done about that kind of stigma? I'm going to let you work on that while I ask our panellists to tell us a story that really places you 
in the middle of this menstrual hygiene and the menstrual hygiene gap that we have regarding menstrual health as well. Gary, people are going to be curious to see you in the conversations. I will start with you. Nice to see you. Thank you. And, you know, curious is the is the right word to start with. I can clearly remember, um, you know, 12 year old me, I think it was 11 or 12 elementary school. And there's the day of the talk. Boys and girls are separated. Um, girls go into a classroom. We're not told what it was about. You know, we're sort of all but jumping up to the windows to kind of, you know, say, what are they getting the talk about? We're sent out to the playground. Um, you know, I think it's gotten a little more sophisticated in some parts of the world, but there is still that division, right? This is something that happens to girls and women's bodies, and boys are often not given much information. Uh, we partner with UNFPA on thinking about how countries can get better about having these conversations, but I think that's where we set it up, right, of this idea that this is taboo, this is something only for girls and women, you as boys and men should just stay to the side of it. And it creates all these, you know, this mystery that um, too often gets turned into teasing, to bullying. And we just, we make from the very beginning this idea that um, what happens to our reproductive bodies, right, to our sexual bodies is stuff that women have to take care of. Um, and I think that happens, right, we set that, we set that up my 11 year old self, right? Saw that of just how we, we do it. You can almost mark the line right here. We make this a women and girls thing and boys are set on this journey of kind of, we don't get much information about our sex and about sexuality. Bodies are the things of women to take care of. And that starts in menstruation. It goes through contraception. It goes through childbirth. And I would say it even goes through menopause that we continue to think this is not stuff that men and boys should pay attention to. Um, and so we ignore it. And I think too often um, we, we, we kind of repress the empathy that we should have as men in this conversation. And I think we miss opportunities to set boys off, you know, in a life that says, this is part of half of humanity. Um, be a supporter of it, acknowledge it, don't look away. It's not a separate room for you. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm honored that you included me in this conversation and I think um, it should be more than just one man on a panel. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Danielle, so good to have you. Your story, your story that really centers you in menstrual health and the menstrual health gap is what? Well, I will go back really, really far. Uh, where I, When I was a very little girl, before even having my menstruation, I used to uh, um, spend a lot of time with my grandmother who was an, on a farm and I would sleep, have sleepovers uh, with her and doing these sleepovers we slept in the same room and she was telling me stories about how life was uh, when she was growing up and one story which really impacted me and the fact you know I know it's still today is that she told me that one day her elder sister came to her and crying, you know, absolutely unconsolable, saying that she was bleeding and she didn't know from where. And she was absolutely uh, convinced um, that uh, something bad was happening to her, that she would have like a kind of a cancer, something really bad. So both these sisters went to the mother and the mother just calmed them down and said, well, you just became a woman. Uh, so with zero information. I was fortunate enough to grow up with parents who I had a little sister who was born four years later than me. So when uh, this little sister came into the world, my parents took that as an opportunity to start really talking to me and my brother about um, sexuality, education, our bodies, etc. Uh, nevertheless, you know, so, uh, this story of my grandmother, which feels like a long time ago, it's something which we see millions of girls during the world still going uh, through today. Millions of girls um, still grow up with very, very little knowledge uh, on what is happening to their bodies. And Gary, you will ha be happy to hear that my father was one of the first ones to talk to me about the importance of menstrual health, etc. And again, but that's also not the norm in many places of the world. Uh, parents, including fathers, really shy, shy away from that. Um, I saw this when I worked in I, my first job at the UN was in Niger. Um, absolute, I sh saw this with girls there, but I also see this now. I have an 11 year old girl in the schools here in the United States, and she comes back and tells me exactly the same, that girls do not want to talk about it, they are embarrassed. Uh, so this is a, a, an, an issue which we're facing 
regardless of the country we're in, the societies we're in, the communities are in, and really something we need to, to address. Nadia. Yeah, I would say that for me, I started my career in periods about 10 years ago when I was 16. And what really inspired it was actually just learning about period poverty in the US because first of all, periods aren't really talked about as well in school. I would say that one of the constant reminders that I have in my daily life is hearing stories of people hiding their tampons up their sleeve, going to the bathroom. And it's always such a wake up call of, it's an unspoken thing we're taught to do because this little wad of cotton represents so much potential shame, right? But for me, when I was 16, I heard stories from homeless women in my local community abusing things like toilet paper or socks or brown paper grocery bags or cardboard to take care of their periods. And it will always very much stick with me seeing someone um, explain to me how they would take the sides of the cardboard off, rub the corrugated inner part in their hands to make a softer pad. And it was a wake up call and realizing that this was a, such an obvious issue that I had never learned of before. And what a privilege it is for me to not having thought of period poverty. But even further than that, when I started doing research online, trying to understand more about the issue, there was more literature about it in you know, the global South and organizations talking about it at a global level, but it's this issue that's invisibilized within the States to kind of think, oh, this is not an issue within the States, right? And so that was actually a really big part of what got me interested in taking action. And I think about those stories that originally got me into this work every single day. Today, I'm in Arkansas to fight the tampon tax. Uh, when I started this work 10 years ago, the tampon tax, which is the sales tax on period products, considering them not essential goods, existed in 40 states. Now we're in 20 states, so we've made progress. But the U.S. is quite far behind when it comes to menstrual equity. And so, you know, I continue to remind myself of why we do this and those stories that have carried, carried me till today um, in all the work that I do. From our online audience, we need to talk about menstrual health even more, really appreciating this conversation. And sadly, I'm going to quote now, sadly, it is a taboo in many countries, but it's only when we raise awareness and ask questions that we close the gap. Let's raise awareness. Let's ask some questions. Where are we now? What is the state of menstrual health on a global scale? Danielle, help us get started. Well, I would like to start with, I mean, say this is actually quite a positive story. Uh, we can uh, point to all the gaps which are still there and, and then we, you know, just these opening stories show that we are far from uh, having broken down all the stigma. But at the global level, what we see is that menstruation is, high, uh, is increasingly recognized as being uh, a human rights issue. We have seen um, you know, at the United Nations where I work uh, in 2019, the UN General Assembly expressed uh, and recognized the neglect of menstrual uh, health uh, as an issue in schools, workplaces, health centers, etc. Uh, we also have a resolution which was passed at the Human Rights Council to identify uh, menstrual health as a human rights issue uh, and also an issue of gender equality. And this was passed by consensus, which shows that really countries are coming together around this. Uh, so this resolution highlights that the issues of uh, shame, taboo, misconception uh, that often result from insufficient information um, uh, uh, and menstrual supply, sanitation, all of that is, is, re uh, is reflected in, in this resolution. So, so on the global level, there seems to be a, a recognition of menstrual health, uh, part of SOHR, Section Reproductive Health and Rights, an important human rights issue, um, which has a huge implications for a health outcomes. So, so that's very positive. The other thing, and, and Nadia already alluded to it, is that we see policymakers are increasingly taking action at the domestic uh, level. Um, so 10 years ago, um, and we said, you know, this is our 10th menstrual health or so menstrual hygiene day. So 10 years ago, there was really relatively little public awareness uh, about the public health, economic and social and human rights consequences of, of menstruation stigma. Um, but uh, as Daniel, again, do, you mind if I, do you mind if I ask you, how did you know that? And then then that helps us understand, well, now the public is a lot more knowledgeable. How did you know that 10 years ago? The public well, I mean, and again, I'm not talking about perhaps the, the 
overall public, as we mentioned in our uh, uh, opening statements, there's still a lot to do there, but I'm talking about policymakers and how do we know that? Because we see, for instance, in Africa, uh, we have the African uh, Coalition of Menstrual Health, which came together in the last couple of years. We see more countries taking action on uh, what Nadia calls the tampon tax, like bringing down taxes uh, for on menstrual products. Uh, we see even some countries uh, instituting paid menstrual leave for uh, for those women uh, or, or people who menstruate who uh, experience painful and disabil disabilitating periods, such as in Spain, for instance. So this has not been there uh, 10 years ago. So this is really an awareness uh, which policy makers uh, are, um, where we can say, see some action. Um, Sahil, progress in 10 years, what have you seen? And put your microphone on and then we can hear you. Good point. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Femi. Let's start, start uh, again. So, yeah, I was just going to say that I agree with Danielle's observation here that I think definitely uh, on a uh, on a on a policymaker level, I would say there is progress. Uh, I think that the, the problem starts a little bit earlier. Also to your question, Femi, how do we know uh, where we are? There is very little uh, transparency on the state of global menstrual health because, you know, we don't really measure we don't really measure it. And of course, measuring it is also slightly difficult because the, plop, the problem is so manifold, right? So it's about do people have access uh, to the product, yes or no? Are the product that they have access to safe and affordable, yes or no? Uh, do we have, you know, a situation where people have access to clean water as well as clean and safe sanitation facilities? Do people live in a taboo and stigma-free environment? If so, how do you measure that? Uh, do people, you know, have the education information that they need to self-manage their menstruation? So I think we still need to do a lot of work in actually measuring uh, where we are and creating transparency because I truly believe no matter whether it's a policymaker, a business uh, leader, uh, or a civil society, what gets measured gets done. And I think there we still need to do a lot because otherwise it will remain very anecdotal. I would agree with the sentiment that we have moved, but I would feel a lot more comfortable uh, with that uh, observation. You know, if I would have more holistic view uh, on where on where exactly we are. However, though, uh, we we have a bit of research also that we do on a regular basis. I'm just going to pick out. Uh, one particular element here, which, however, you know, unfortunately, we don't see a lot of movement, which is when it comes to taboos and stigmas uh, around uh, menstruation. This is unfortunately a very, very important, you know, element because, you know, changing society's perception uh, of a topic uh, is a very complicated uh, thing to do and it takes time, right? Some would argue it's a generational... Years you know, it issue. Changes. I wouldn't, yeah. exactly. So, you know, so I think there is, you know, also still some areas here uh, where we where we haven't moved. And then I think it's very difficult to say then, you know, what is more important now to move first and second. Uh, so I think the topic still needs uh, also some attention in terms of really measuring it, as we have done with many other global issues uh, that we are facing, by the way, uh, environment to environmental issues to name one. I'm not, I don't want to, you know, weigh, uh, weigh them against each other, but I think we need to take the same kind of rigor uh, when it comes to actually creating transparency here like we would do elsewhere. Nadia, there's a, there's a comment in um, our comment section which I know will uh, totally resonate with you. Menstruation blood was blue in ads in France until recently, so the silence was strongly reinforced. I also remember seeing menstrual um, health products and, and they would say, this, this is how um, amazing this pad is. And they would pour blue water onto the pad. Is that part of our challenge that we need to actually go, you know, blood is red. We can make menstrual products and be really honest about what it looks like, what it feels like. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I am biased, but I think that talking about period blood and even showing it is a huge opportunity, not only for breaking the stigma, but education. And I've, you know, I've tried not posting my period blood on social media for years and tried writing a book about it. And while I think that helps people get to talk about it, there's nothing like showing period blood when it comes to actually talking about what is the color? What is the consistency? Should I be worried about a blood clot? What does a blood clot look like, right? And when I started building my platform on TikTok, and now between me and the brand, we have about 6 million followers across channels, but I have 4 million followers personally on TikTok where I am 
making content about my period blood, showing it even online. And I used to have those videos taken down, my account banned. And I think that the fact that I've been able to garner millions of followers with an account that is not banned has also shown some of the progress that we've made, right? That we're able to talk about this. But, you know, for me, like the, what really inspired me to show period blood was that no matter how much I could say, period blood can be brown, right? Or blood clots of a certain size can be normal. I would still get so many questions from paranoid menstruators around the world who would say, what is this black slug coming out of me, right? When they, what they meant is, you know, a part of their uterine lining, right? Or they would ask, why is it that my pad looks gooey when I take it off, right? And so I think that for me, you know, especially now running a period care brand, it felt like an obvious decision and it sounds kind of crazy when I say it now, but if I ran a clothing company and I wanted to show people how well the clothes fit, I would put them on and I would show them how it looks. And so now running a pad company, making pads, making tampons, I think the best thing that I can do to really answer all the questions from potential customers, but menstruators out there is really like show them exactly how it works, right? And so much of what we exist to do is prove that sustainable products don't mean you have to sacrifice on eff efficacy or comfort. Sometimes it means you can have more efficacy and comfort. And so I want to show people that. And I think in today's day and age with a Gen Z, Gen Alpha audience that has grown up on short form video, it's a huge opportunity to be able to talk about it. And and, you know, I think that we will continue to try to push barriers. We regularly will get ads or videos taken down or flagged for violent and graphic content. And I think that even examples like that, right, where you see that it's list marked as violent content shows the kind of stigma that we are continuing to deal with. Where are we now? Have we got away from blue period blood apart from your campaign, your work that you're doing to, to kind of desensitize people into the reality of what menstruation actually looks like. Have we, have we moved a little bit in the way that we talk about products, the way that products are presented, or is part of the movement talking to producers of menstrual health products too? I would say that it's a mix of both. We have made a lot of progress. I mean, again, 10 years ago when I started in this space, it was still radical to even say the word period publicly and in media, right? And I would have interviews, and this is 2014, 2015, that would get flagged as inappropriate. My book that came out in 2018 called Period Power is considered a banned book. Right. And so even today, in today's day and age, there's still a lot of progress to be made. That being said, I am very proud of the fact that we're all sitting here on a call today, people from around the world talking about periods, prioritizing this as an issue. Heck, we have a whole holiday on it, you know. And so I would say that we have made a lot of progress. But, you know, I, I know the team was just talking about the importance of research as well. That's something yeah. that I've always cared deeply about. And um, I previously ran a nonprofit called period.org. And one of the things we really invested in was research of the stigma. And we found that the number one emotion that people would have around periods is embarrassment or shame, right? And still today, I'm actually currently traveling across the country. I'm driving to a different city every single day, doing these focus groups and meet and greets with you know, fans of the brand. I continue to hear stories from people who tell me, oh, I got my period and I had no idea what a period was. Or I got my period and I didn't tell anybody for weeks because I was so embarrassed, even their own mom. And, you know, I think that I continue to be reminded by how much work is still needed to be done. And so I think that's why having these conversations and honestly why I care so deeply about the power of social media is that the way we break stigma is to have conversations. And how do we create viral conversations through viral content and through the viral media distribution of things? I think products and CPG companies have the unique opportunity and responsibility to be a part of that work. If you look at how the period stigma has been shaped over the last century, a lot of it has been done by the hands of this industry, right? Because we've been sold this narrative by the product to hide your period, forget you have a period. For years, the, these companies never even said the word period, right? And they really tied the idea of you get a period, you stick a tampon in, and then you can wear a white dress and go on a hot date and play tennis, which is not really skate. my personal. Yeah. 
Yeah, <laughs> exactly. My experience with a period, my period is more like lying on the bathroom floor crying, you know. See, that but, you would know, be a viral that, ad, right? That would be a viral if ad. We've done it. Lying yeah. with a hot we've water bottle it. on your tummy, groaning, that would be an, an authentic ad. Yeah. So, I mean, and also I coming that... in there, maybe also uh, Nadia, because uh, I think you also you, no, you ahead, referred yeah. a bit to, let's say, to the to the incumbents here as well, which I would say uh, ST is also one of them. Uh, and back to this whole blue liquid conversation as well, because, I mean, we were the first ones in 2017 to show uh, period blood in the mainstream uh, TV commercial. And we got a bad, lot of backlash. Uh, for that, I might also add, right? We have also done uh, campaigns where we have talked about, you know, uh, the different shapes and forms uh, of uh, of vulvas. We have talked about pain stories when it comes to endometriosis and how it affects people, right? And we have also very graphically uh, done so, of course, with a diff with, with with the ambition to also shock a little bit, right? Because I think if you want to change a narrative, you also need to shock a little bit. You need to have a controversial debate because if you, uh, as one of my uh, of my colleagues here uh, said, uh, working with these campaigns, you know, if you if you don't really have that shock moment, probably you weren't brave enough in a way, right? To really, you know, change the conversation. So I think there's still lots we have to do. Um, but I think also, despite the fact that, you know, brands like us and like August and many others have, you know, taken a different approach on talking, there's still, we're facing, you know, certain stigmas. And I just want to give an example of what happened here today in Stockholm in the headquarter, because as we're celebrating Menstrual Hygiene Day, we want to take the opportunity to also, you know, share uh, that day with the people that we share this office building with here in Stockholm, which is a random collection of you know other businesses and companies and organizations and we handed out uh, period underwear uh, for to people you know to uh, for them to try it uh, so to say in celebration of this day and like not just men but also the amount of women you know just shying away basically no 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 it's fine it's fine i'm good yeah. i'm good no, no what is this oh meds oh no 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 thank you you know and maybe for your part no 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 and people are walking away right so i think there's still so much you know to do i don't want to point to just the men here because we also really faced a little bit of, you know, resistance here also from some people who we assume, you know, to also potentially be menstruators, uh, you know, who really don't want to be seen with a menstruation product. In this case, it's not even a tampon, it's an underwear, you know. So, uh, yeah, that tells you also something about the taboos and the stigmas uh, of this category still. Mm. Can I can I jump in with a question and comment? And Nadia, I'd love to hear, you know, any thoughts of, um, your ideas on, you know, sort of in, engaging men in the conversation. I'm wearing my um, menstrual bracelet today that Wash United started and has tried to get some men at least to, you know, give them out to other men. I mean, I think one of the things that we see is that, you know, there's there's so little healthy conversation with boys in general about sexuality and about bodies. And, you know, your question earlier about whether are we moving ahead? I mean, on, on the one hand, you know, and, and Nadia, you've tapped into this, right? The, you know, the access to information about bodies and just about things in general, right? Online is, you know, is a click away. Um, so it's, and ironically, boys have, you know, they've never had more access to information about sex, but what information is that, right? It is overwhelmingly porn as the first source of information. It is, I mean, so boys know what bodies look like but they see idealized, often objectified, and often harmed bodies presented. No discussions of bodies that feel pain, that bleed, um, you know, all the stuff that we need boys to have conversations about as well. Um, so I'm kind of, you know, on the one hand, thrilled that we're having conversations. I think there's probably more boys from the information that we see, probably more boys who at least have been exposed to some information about it because of campaigns like um, you know, the multiple ones that you are involved in and others. But I don't think that it necessarily is turning into the empathy and the understanding and the broader sense of sexual and reproductive bodies that we need boys to know about. Um, so I would love to hear other examples. We just, we don't see that many. They tend to be kind of a man over here, a man over there who's talked about it, but not really sort of organized efforts. Um, and would love to hear, you know, if you know of any. Yeah, if I can just... I would say that... Oh, go ahead. I, not, not no, I just want to. Okay, go oh, first. Okay. I just wanted to add the parents in there and the educators, but I'll come oh, back yeah. to that point. All right. Okay. I would right, say Nadia. that I, I'm a really big proponent of actually taking gender out of the conversation. And I know I think yeah. that's 
that's kind of been labeled as a very much like a Gen Z issue. I'm geriatric Gen Z, I'm 26, so I'm on the older end of this generation. <laughs> but, you know, for me, so much of what I believe in is not having this just be something for women and girls. And I think that when we start to see examples, wait, my sister's alarm is going off. We're traveling together. Um, we don't, we know, don't hear say, it, so you can carry on as long as it's okay, not good, a good, fire good. alarm, in which case we'd be very worried. But carry on. Um, but, you know, I think when we start to say, oh, boys aren't involved in the conversation, it's it's kind of birthed from the fact that we, whenever we talk about this, and even as we set up this call today, I think a call in for all of us is we say, this is a conversation for women and girls. Boys have a seat at the table because we've invited you here, right? But I think what's really important to, to recognize is I actually believe that sex and gender are two completely different things, right? So sex being the biology you have, gender being how society labels you, the assumptions around you. I think when you start to recognize we all have bodies, Bodies, we take care of our bodies and we want to support each other in our bodies from the impetus, right? It's we are all at the table to talk about bodily health rather than this is a women and girls space, that is a men's space. You know, put on top of that, we are seeing continuously more fluidity around gender, right? Something that we're very proud of is from the very beginning of our brand, about 12% of our community were trans and trans men and non-binary individuals who also got a period and have not felt recognized or included in the space. And so whenever we have conversations, we talk about menstrual health you know, being a menstruator or a non-menstruator. And if you're a non-menstruator, how do you empathize with that? I think it's also recognizing all the time, you know, having conversations like, you know, your mom got a period and then for nine months she didn't, and then you popped up, you know? Periods are a part of everyday life. And I think the more we can inject conversations around periods from having period products in the men's restroom, right? For trans men, but also just to have cis men be able to see it. I think that's a really important part of it. Um, and then I also think a, a big part of the initiatives are just being really cognizant of the fact that we go out of our way to make sure that when we do outreach for people to come to these events, when we build our teams, it's important to have non-menstruators at the table and to also, you know, recognize that we still live in a world that's, you know, for the most part led by cis men. And so how do you include them in the conversation as we figure out the best way to take down the stigma. Nadia, let me, let me share something with you, and that is um, globally, 40% of fathers will talk to their daughters about menstruation, but fewer than that will talk to their sons about menstruation. So I do understand what you're saying about not thinking about gender identities particularly, but if you have a challenge with let's say young non-menstruators who Gary works with about them really not knowing anything about menstruation, where do you start? I think that where you start is again, trying to reach them where they're at, right? Which is, you know, I don't think that a campaign then that says, boys talk about periods is gonna get them involved. I actually think that the way I would go about that is saying, who are they already influenced by? And how do you have conversations with them about periods, right? I don't think that me as Nadia and saying that we're gonna get all these boys to be you know, the men in menstruation or some viral campaign is what's gonna take off, right? Because I think that that's not what's gonna resonate. What's going to resonate is to say, let's recognize who they're already following, right? Who is maybe the male influencer that is, get, is, is someone that already has that authority, isn't written off as like, oh, they're talking about periods, I don't wanna be a part of that but to really inject it into mainstream conversation. That's where I think partnerships, whether it be with social media influencers, celebrities, brands even, right? Like, you know, maybe the dream partner for Essity is Xbox, right? Or something like that, you know, to say, we're gonna actually meet them where they're at with an unexpected partnership that isn't written off. And I, I actually think the 40% of fathers is a number of, that sounds much higher than what I would assume. I, would assume I was surprised. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And getting on the issue of the parents, um, and I know, uh, you know, it was brought up before. One of the things that I am constantly baffled by is that 
most parents don't even know basic details about periods, right? Because they grew up in the same system that has made even less progress, right? They've never got comprehensive sex ed. We still have legislation in the US that bans talking about periods in public schools before grade nine, right? And it's the parents who also went through that system. And so when we start to think about who is educating the next generation, I don't, I think it's a lot less of the parents than we hope it would be, right? Because the parents also need their education. So as we have these conversations, I think it's also important that we're building for education for the parents and for this next generation. And oftentimes it's this younger generation that's teaching the parents, right? And so I think that a lot of it is just figuring out who has influence now and partnering with them to bring conversations about periods into non-period conversations, right? Because at the end of the day, people still shy away from the subject. And so I think that's where collaboration is so important. I see a FIFA World Cup menstrual health collaboration <laughs> in our future, maybe. Uh, Danielle, go ahead. Can I say, I, I, I don't think we need to even go that grandiose than that. And, you know, I know you like stories um, and uh, Nadia, your point of the, the adolescents, the, the young people teaching the parents. I had such a teachable moment last week uh, where my adolescent daughter started her period and she ran out of tampons and she asked her 15 uh, year old brother, hey, can you go to CVS to grab me these tampons? And my reaction was, hey, come on, you know, you can go and get your tampons yourself. And he gave me a full lecture, uh, how important it is that boys go to CVS without any shame, pick up tampons for them, for their daughters. If we want to normalize periods, this is where it starts. And I have to admit, she was probably right. And my son, without any grumbling, went uh, and picked up the tampons and picked up also some candies, which she likes to go to. So, you know, win-win. Um, so just to say that, you know, there is a new generation uh, coming in, but um, that doesn't mean that we are there yet. And I think it, I would like to really stress the importance of, you know, what you just said, Nadia, uh, also supporting parents in these talks um, and supporting also teachers. We have, I mean, I, I looked up a, a study uh, in the UK uh, where uh, around, you know, most of the teachers said, yeah, well, the sexuality education, which we have, in terms of materials is adequate, but over 80% said that they were not well prepared to deliver this, this content. So there's a big gap there that we need to help teach uh, educators, help parents to be comfortable in this, give them the tools to do so. I know, you know, we have plenty of good material, including from Ikrimundo and others uh, on um, on how to uh, put sexuality education in schools. And we have been celebrating the successes to, in, in terms of menstrual health right now. But we cannot not talk about also the rollback of this. Uh, you talked about the US, uh, Nadia. We just saw that in the UK, you know, they rolled back sexuality education and said we cannot speak about these issues to girls and boys uh, under the age of nine. Uh, and we do know that menstru uh, menarche, uh, the age of menarche is going down. Uh, and in a nice way, this weekend I saw uh, an ad in, um, in India uh, where they realized that we, yeah, the girls start to menstruate younger and younger. And they have to start to talk about bodily changes, etc. in the, at a younger age. Uh, and they try to normalize that. And actually, uh, Sahil, this is an, uh, a campaign by a, a private sector company. Uh, who's trying to, to, to start this conversation in schools. Uh, so, so we see a little bit, uh, you know, a change of, you know, we see some of the more developed countries rolling back these gains uh, and some developing countries uh, really moving into this space. And, you know, so, 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 you know, you can see it half glass, half full, glass half empty, but definitely, uh, you know, pushing back against this pushback is absolutely important if we want to make any progress uh, also on mental health. I really want to focus our attention in the remaining time that we have together on breaking down the barriers. So we're looking at solutions right now. Uh, from our online audience, most of the time, men are comfortable buying a period product in the store, but that is as far as it goes and leave the information mm. or education to women and girls. Inclusivity spans across genders and we need to normalize period talks. Gary, that's resonating with you, go ahead. Yeah, I think the, you know, and, and I, I do see the role, obviously we need parents part of this, but I, you know, think about other peer relations as well. I mean, how much of, um, you know, how 
how boys or male identified individuals will talk to other male identified individuals, et cetera. Like how do we, how do we build the kind of the capacity that we all talk to each other? I also worry, you know, there's, there's a huge amount that Danielle's talked about, about, you know, schools being a place that we can do this. And we are facing a rollback of comprehensive sexuality education in just about anywhere we look. Um, we can, you know, we can despair about that. We have to keep fighting about it for sure. But I also, I'll pick up on a point that, that Danielle made of, of, I'm sorry, that Nadia made around, you know, take these messages to where boys are. They are online. Young men are online in numbers that we've never seen before. Um, lots of this space we call the manosphere is lots of harmful stuff, but there's also just lots of, you know, conversations about health and fitness and bodies. You know, the importance of moderators and influencers there sharing messages um, about this. And I think, you know, both social media as well as mainstream media. You know, I remember at my, you know, dining table when my um, now adult daughter was a teenager, the Big Mouth episode of Everybody Bleeds. If anybody once saw that one, it was, you know, Netflix, right? This main, you know, sort of mainstream animated cartoon for for teens getting a conversation and a really funny song, you know, just the the the, the places like that that we need to insert this conversation. So it's not like it's a, it is a bit like, you know, the sex talk of like, okay, today we're going to have that sex talk instead of saying, no, this is, you know, sex is all around us. And this and menstruation is a part of, you know, half of humanity. And, um, and, and so I think, yeah, it's kind of looking outside of these places that it's not the package talk. I want dads to talk about it, absolutely. But I want brothers and cousins and coaches and online um, moderators and influencers talking about this. Um, so I think it's you know trying to be really creative. What we used to do as educational campaigns, et cetera, are really not yet sort of caught up with you know the online lives that we now live. And even our language, what we'll say, online lives versus IRL, you know, most young people and most of us don't live that that difference anymore. It's all one thing. So how do we step into that um, with both the power and the challenge, I suppose, is where I would where I would push us next on this. Gary, I don't want to make you uncomfortable and you're lots and you're in many uncomfortable places and this is a very comfortable <laughs> space for you. But if people are watching and they're thinking, ah, I have some non-menstruating young people and I want to tell them about menstruation because I, I watched the SSE Essential Talks about closing yeah. the menstrual health gap. What would you say? What tools would you give them? I mean, all the, you know, all the above. Order some of these bracelets. Look at, you know, go home and talk about, you know, kind of how it is in your household to talk about it. Think about the way, you know, even this critical media analysis that we've done, right? That a lot of our advocacy has been around of, you know, why is menstrual blood blue? Like putting young people to work to think about, right? We are critical thinkers about the world around us. One of the things that we'll do in, in an educational setting is sort of how did you learn about it? Go home and between this week and next week when we see each other again, you know, think about how it's talked about. Think about ways you've seen taboos. Think about something that's healthy that's happened there so that, you know, we're critical constructors of the world around us. Um, rather than kind of the package talk. Um, there's necklaces that go with these things. There's, you know, what do you think this is, right? Hold it up and say, what, what's going on here? So that we don't do that kind of, I mean, we all just groan when you bring us the package talk. Um, so, you know, make it kind of weave it into some conversation that becomes, yeah, it becomes a conversation. Um, and I absolutely love, you know, and I, I think these, you know, we, we can give credit, we can give, you know, kind of fancy sounding names to them, but these environmental interventions, right? Where you put menstrual products in a, you know, a male identified bathroom, for example, when you get, you know, not only does your son go buy the product, but ask him to talk about, some, talk to his peers about it um, so that we make those kind of teachable moments. Those seem to me much more effective than, you know, here's the package talk that you can have. Would you hold up your wrist in front of your face? The only time I'm going to ask you to do this. Okay, and then tell me what that is. This, so well, I should probably look to Nadia because I think period.org worked and had these versions of these as well. Wash um, United came out with these as just a simple educational tool so that somebody would say, what is that guy wearing a bracelet that's got five red dots on it? Sure. Um, and, you know, the five red dots 
showing menstruation in the, you know, together with the other white dots of um, non-menstruating days. Um, you know, fertility education or reproductive health education have used bracelets that show, you know, show fertile days as well with necklaces, et cetera. Um, so coming out of, you know, kind of just popular education approaches rather than um, that you could get a conversation going, you could see it, it's tactile. Um, so that's, I, you know, we'd have to talk to them about how effective that's been, but I certainly found it a clever way to start a conversation. Then they wanted you, you know, pass it to 10 more. Um, they try to get men to pass it to 10 more men. Um, you know, that's, that's one way we pass it on, but I think whatever it takes to do, you know, kind of what feels like a more natural conversation starter. Nadia, does it work? I mean, I think that it works in the sense that, I mean, we literally have someone wearing the bracelet, showing it and talking about it. And, you know, it's, it, it is a part of the conversation. I think that in terms of, you know, and I've always, I've, I've done the bracelet thing again, like the organization I founded, we were really tried it out. I think one of the things that it kind of, again, the blockage of it is that it reaches primarily progressive cis men who are already interested in supporting menstruators in their lives and open to having the conversation. To me, what the win will be is when you reach cis men who you say periods and they say, oh, no, 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 this is not my thing, right? And I think that there is, um, there is a need right now to reach those people who are not only living out the period stigma, but full on perpetuating it, right? And I think that when you reach those, um, you know, uh, those kind of influences, that's when you know it will be a win. That being said, if we can get like Travis Kelsey, Taylor Swift to get Travis Kelsey to wear um, a bracelet and give it to all of his teammates, then I would say absolutely, yes, it is working. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think that when you kind of reach that, that sort of level of people who, live out the trope of masculinity, toxic masculinity, that in so many cases of society is put at the polar opposite or seen as the polar opposite of talking about menstrual blood. You know, I think that's when I will say absolutely it is work. So I, I would stray away from saying it's working or not working. I think it is working because we're talking about it. But do I think that this is gonna be the way that like we get men to talk about periods? Probably not. I'm again, really, really interested, like I'm working really hard on figuring out ways to get into the world of sports and, you know, entertainment, because I think that's where you can develop really unexpected media forms to get people to talk about periods. Can I, gonna, oh yes, go ahead, go ahead. I was just yeah, can I just say that, that, that um, uh, I think we, we need to take this in an, in an context in the context and this uh, bracelets etc it's a global advocacy campaign um and you know it has a specific target people like gary here uh, who will can use it to you know showcase um uh, their you know position and their advocacy for it uh, you know any uh, i talked about all the advances which we had in resolutions if we can give these to permanent representative ambassadors, et cetera, you know, to sensitize them on the issue. So, so I think this is a good, but we need to uh, tailor our advocacy and our work with, with men and boys um, to the different contexts. And then I'm just giving you an example of UNFPA. We worked in, in Bhutan um, with, uh, with, uh, with Buddhist nuns who, surprise, surprise, also menstruate. Uh, and so we worked with them about uh, menstrual stigma and menstrual, uh, menstrual health um, and realized that we really needed to talk also to, to Buddhist monks. Uh, and so, and that was done in a very cultural appropriate way. We worked with the uh, queen of Bhutan, who's an advocate for SRH and menstrual health, etc. So, so there's ways of how you would uh, address different communities. The menstrual bracelet would probably have, have no effect in that context. Uh, but there are other tools which we can use, uh, and I think we just have to adapt them to the to the different context in which we in which we work. So we have 1.8 billion people around the world who menstruate every month. One of them put a comment in our comment section. Here it is, uh, Sahil. I'm going to point this towards you. We need global laws regarding menstrual health. Today I had a meeting. It didn't go very well. I was not with the same energy or power that I normally have. And you know what? 
it's the first day of my menstrual cycle. Coincidence or not, some people are more fragile during this time. So you're sitting in Sweden and about 25% of people in Sweden say they're not satisfied with how their workplace copes with their menstrual cycle or their menstrual health needs. Would a global law, national laws, would that help? Is that a solution, solutions? So I think there is different uh, different solutions here. So first of all, I'm very happy that someone brought up the topic about how menstruation affects uh, also people at the at the workplace, because that is, uh, of course, also a huge problem, because we know that uh, two out of three um, uh, girls or women across the globe would say that they either miss school uh, or work because of menstruation. So workplace, we haven't talked about so much, but of course, it's a very, very important environment uh, also for people, you know, to, to be safe in uh, and to be able to menstruate in a dignified way to even be per able to participate uh, also in work life and to show up uh, with their fullest potential when they can and also step aside when they cannot and uh, find a, an environment of understanding there. So I think, you know, when it comes to kind of like the first step here, I think is again awareness raising. Uh, we have at ST started a, a series of courageous conversations uh, on menstruation, uh, which talks about menstruation from menarche to uh, menopause, uh, to really make people understand, make managers understand the ones who are leading people, but also the ones who are working in teams with others who menstruate, no matter whether you are a menstruator or not, to understand what are the implications of that. And how does that affect, you know, my ability to show up uh, with my full potential at work, either with regards to being able to travel, uh, being able to sit through, let's say, a four hour uh, meeting, stand in front of a group and do a presentation for 120 minutes, et cetera, et cetera. So really to also make sure that there is awareness around this so that this is also something that can be talked about and that can be brought up, you know, especially now uh, with regards to what was uh, posted here. Of course, an ideal scenario you would be able to also have that conversation right before the presentation, right after the presentation, right? To, you know, feel safe uh, to do that. Then, of course, you know, there is also other policies you can put in place with regards, you know, to, uh, allowing for extra days off uh, of work, you know, uh, when you're menstruating and do not feel up to the to the task to show up uh, at work, whether it's virtual or, or in person. Uh, then, of course, um, there is uh, also laws you can put in place with regards to employers having the necessity to provide menstruation uh, products uh, at the workplace, uh, you know, uh, in the variety needed. So people, again, uh, can manage their menstruation uh, also, you know, uh, at the workplace uh, with regards to, you know, how warm uh, does a room need to be? Uh, does that, uh, you know, preference change when you're in menopause or not in menopause? So there is many things, you know, with regards to the physical workplace that need to be taken care of. There is stuff with regards to, let's say, the mental health and safety that one senses uh, at the workplace that needs to be taken care of. And then, of course, also as you go through the different phases and life stages of life, it might also, you know, impact, let's say, uh, your career, uh, you know, ambitions, uh, how you want to go about work. Uh, do you want to be in person? Not in so, I mean, there is, it, it's a very complex matter. And I think definitely, I'm not sure if it's laws that you need, but definitely I would invite uh, every uh, every business uh, to 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 take stock here and to say how do we want to ensure menstrual well-being uh, at the workplace and then take a very close look you know whether you are really inclusive with those policies when it comes to different age groups when it comes to you know different abilities when it comes to let's say different ethnicities cultural differences etc people working in the office versus people working uh, in a factory uh, you know to really uh, take a proactive uh, stance here because again you can't switch on off uh, your menstruation, uh, depending on what your work schedule looks like, unfortunately. Uh, Daniel, I want to bring up a point that you were really keen to share with our online audience, and that is that the starting of a menstrual cycle should be a joyous, positive moment, milestone. And we've been talking about it as a challenging part of somebody who menstruates their life. And I want to make sure that we reset this with your positivity. Danielle, go ahead. Yeah, so I think that you already said it. You know, so the what we would like to see as, as UNFPA, as people working on sexual reproductive health and rights, and you know, Gary mentioned the same. You know, we, we don't want 
anything related to sexuality, including menstrual health um, and, you know, uh, sexual and reproductive health be, you know, a, 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 a source of embarrassment, a source of shame. Uh, on the other hand, you know, we really want um, young people uh, to to feel that the period is a is a happy fact of life. You know, when my little girl uh, started menstruating at 11, which was very young for her, she was still in 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 primary school. You know, I had I made sure that they had a little, little necklace uh, on the side so that when that arrived, I could you know give it to her and say, "This is a great moment. Here I have a little gift, so she can remember uh, this." Um, this moment as something positive, something to celebrate. I I know of an Italian friend of mine, um, when she menstruated, her mother uh, baked her a special cake uh, so to celebrate. And I think this is really the, the attitude we need to um, uh, spread of, of saying this is a, you know, like we, everyone who is a parent, we celebrate all the milestones our children go through. They start walking, they start talking, they go to school, etc. This is part of natural, development, the milestone of, yes, now you're maturing, uh, you're getting bigger, you're getting older. Um, so so why are we shying away from celebrating menstruation or the, the start of menstruation um, as, as, as a really positive way, a positive moment, uh, so that, that young girls, you know, feel empowered by it rather than feeling ashamed. Yeah. Can I can I jump in on that one as well? I, um, Danielle, I, uh, have a daughter who's half Brazilian, half U.S., and um, my partner is the Brazilian in our household, and it was very much a celebration about it as well. Around, hey, this is yeah, this is this important life, biological, you know, life marker, and um, really felt, you know, compared to my my U.S. family, where the, you know the sort of silence around it was felt very. I hope my daughter perceived that as very empowering and. Um, we as an organization and me as an individual, as a, you know, a male identified individual working in this space, we don't have something similar for boys, right? There's the whole, you know, kind of a first ejaculation and even the word, most folks don't realize that we have a word that we use in English of spermarchy that we talk about, you know, the first time that a boy has um, an ejaculation. And we don't have a similar conversation around that typically. And that is not to, you know, decenter the conversation about menstruating bodies. But I think part of that silence is we also have to have boys feeling um, good, not ashamed about it, to feel like, you know, and I think lots of households are reaching that, but many, many aren't. And I think this is part of the same, you know, the kind of that, that reproductive bodies are, are seen as, you know, they're, they're frightening, they've got to be repressed. Um, and all the kind of taboo and messiness about them instead of celebrating it, um, we, we too often turn into the, you know, don't, don't make me have to think about it. So, yeah, I was glad that you shared that of just making it into a, you know, what a, what a great milestone in our Period bodies. Party. We're, yeah, we're confused. Yeah. What does it mean? Anyway, thanks for bringing that up. So the first few words of our discussion today is time to act. I don't have much time, but I want to hear what your action would be, panel, for our online audience who are listening in and who are watching. Just one thought. It's going to be 30 seconds long. I'm simplifying it, but we know it's a very complex conversation. Nadia, what's your action? I would say talk about it and post the panel on social media. Tell all your friends what you learned. I think social media is a way where it you can then tell people about periods and period poverty, even going back to childhood friends. So I would say post about it. Danielle, what's your action? Time to act. Well, I would, what I just said, I would, I would really uh, encourage everyone listening to consider menstruation at the start of menstruation as a happy fact of life. Uh, and, you know, make sure that we, we talk about it in, in that way. Uh, just, yeah. Gary. Pretty obviously, I would just say talk to boys too. And Period. Sahil. <laughs> Period. Yes. Oh, our very first dad joke. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you, Dad, for the dad I joke. Nobody did. You know, I wanted to let you be able to put that out. We had to have one. 
<laughs> yeah, it's tricky to come after that, but um, I'd say that, you know, uh, I guess most of the people listening here are, you know, already on the believing uh, side of it. So I think, you know, I would just encourage everyone, you know, to uh, to continue, you know, to start small, but continue to also think big, because I think we can all make, you know, a difference. And the little conversations that we have day to day in just, you know, randomly bringing up the topic and just see what happens, you know, uh, think about it next time you're in a room uh, full of people just you know remember that the likelihood of many of those people in the room being uh, in their menstruation uh, right now is quite likely and then try to you know sympathize with it and empathize with it to understand what would that mean you know for what we're doing here you know uh, as we what happened probably before and what's going to happen after we we leave uh, this joint space so I think you know uh, continue to you know uh, do the small things and uh, continue uh, to believe uh, in the bigger change, which uh, I believe uh, is uh, is is achievable, uh, but it takes many many hands, many hearts, and many minds uh, to to achieve. Sahil, Daniel, Nadia, Gary, thank you for being part of this conversation. Time to act: closing the menstrual health gap, an ST essential talk. And thank you for watching.